and we'll be reading out of the New King James Version, and it's Galatians 3, uh, verse 13. Thank you, Kayla. That was beautiful. Galatians 3, 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Good morning. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, heard her sing last week um, about the cross, about Jesus dying on the cross, and I went to her last week. I said, you know what? I wish you would have saved that for, for this week because my, my sermon's called The Day That God Died. And she said, I could do another song if you like. I was like, that would be perfect. So thank you. Now here's something to, for us to reflect or meditate on. God made all seven days but only one he sanctified or set apart, and that is the Sabbath. And then out of, so that was one out of the seven. And then he named two of those days, one being preparation day and the Sabbath. So the Sabbath was so important that he he named or he made one of those days um, so we could prepare for the Sabbath. And with all that being said, I just want to say happy Sabbath. Let us have a word of prayer and we'll get right into it. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you for this Sabbath. We want to thank you for this opportunity to be here to worship you. Lord, um, forgive me of any of these sins that I might have and um, so you could hear my prayer, Lord. We ask now that um, we're ready to open up your word and have a, um, we want to hear from you, Lord. There is nothing that I can say that can help any of these people, Lord. But Lord, only your word can save. So that's who we want to hear from. Hide me behind the cross and let everyone hear and see you. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the day that God died... Thousands and thousands of sermons have been preached, and maybe even into the millions, about the cross. And just like me, you probably heard numerous sermons about the cross, where you heard the speaker express in great detail the death of the Son of God. They may, in a very technical way, Describe that it would mean what it would mean with the physical pain that Jesus would be going through as he receives the nails that either went into his hands or into his wrists. They may decide to preach or to teach what kind of cross was it and how this Roman device was an instrument of torture on how he was hanging there. He would have to lift himself up on those pierced hands just to take one breath. And the excruciating pain he would go through, even to take one breath just to try to stay alive just a little longer. And then he has to do it all over again to take another breath. You might have heard from these sermons that Jesus was crucified naked, that the loincloth we see in the pictures was just put there to hide his nakedness. But the reality was, he was fully exposed before the entire crowd. Maybe you heard in these sermons the lashes that he would receive and how the whips they would use in the Roman time in this era was straps of leather 
that they would actually put into this leather pieces of bone or metal so that even as the le leather would slap across the back, the bone and metal will grip in and then they would rip it off and they would actually tear his back open. Maybe they would describe how the thorns would be pressed into his head over and over in great detail went into describing the pain and the torture of the cross event. But in reality, all of that pain, all of the torture is not the salvation that was earned for us. Have you ever thought of that? I heard a story of a non-Christian telling a Christian about his God. He told the Christian that I don't believe in the Christian God, Jesus, because his God, this non-Christian God, is superior than Jesus. He would tell him that there was a holy man in Arabia who grew up doing good work and wonderful things. Even miracles were done through him. And at the end of his life, he was killed by those who loved him. But he said that he didn't just die in just a few hours like your God, Jesus, did. But when he was crucified, they first skinned him alive. He described to this Christian fellow how they would peel a piece of his body and burn, that pe that burn his body in, in place. And when he would wake up, he would, they would take another piece and again burn him. They would do this till 75% of his exterior layers were removed. And then they made him carry his own cross. But the crowds would throw salt and dirt into the wounds to inflame him. When they arrived, they crucified him. But he didn't die in just a few hours. He spent an entire week on that cross. In the burning sun and the freezing cold of the night. And then, at the end, out of mercy, the gods shot him with arrows and killed him. Then this person asked this Christian um, man, do you, do you want to worship my God instead? So this Christian was totally confused. Not because this Christian was tempted to believe in this other concept, or this man or this person, but because his very foundation of what he believed about salvation and the cross and Jesus was shaken. Because you see, he understood in his own mind and in his own concept that it was the physical pain that Jesus went through on the cross that earned his salvation. It was what Jesus went through, that physical pain, that torture, that seemed so much more than what everybody else went through. But then he began to study the Bible, and he began to really look at the Scripture and in history, trying to figure out how was the death of Christ different than every other death that has ever died. Even those who have been tortured, even those who have died horrible deaths, what is the difference? We can even see in history people who went through more physical pain than Jesus. So you might be saying right now, okay, then prove it. Say, okay, we have these two thieves that were on the cross right next to Jesus. Were they flogged? Yes, of course they were. They were crucified. Did they have to carry their cross? Absolutely. And they carried it all the way to the hill. No one took it over for them. When they got there and they were crucified, when did they die? They died after Jesus. We know this because they tested to see if Jesus was dead. And he was. And the other thieves were still alive. So what did they do to them? They broke their legs. 
So they were alive even after Jesus was dead. You might go on in history and see Christian martyrs through the centuries that were tortured and abused. But this Christian found a fundamental difference between the way that Christians died and the way that Jesus died. And this fundamental difference was this. When Christians died, they were smiling and praising. You remember the story of Stephen in the Bible when he was being stoned? What did he see? He looked up and saw the heavens open up and saw Jesus standing by the right hand of the Father. What a vision he received before he died. What about John Huss, the great Christian reformer? As he was being burned alive, what was he doing? He was singing hymns, praising God and smiling. This Christian guy would see over and over again that God's people go through these horrible, difficult times, but they have this experience of peace and of joy in the midst of this trial. But when you look at the cross of Christ, do you see peace and joy? No. You see Gethsemane of great sorrow. You see that he was downcast and his spirit was burdened. You see that he carried a heavy load. And then when he was on the cross, he cried out to God, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, there's, there was something fundamentally different about the way that Jesus died and the way every other person in history has died. We need to understand this because there are two ways of seeing the cross of Christ. There is the Roman view and there is the Jewish view of it. The Romans, when they were there underneath the cross, simply saw it as an instrument of torture. It was a way of keeping order and, and peace. They would put these people up and nail them to the trees or whatever they could find and just leave them there for a week as they were tortured and they would ultimately die. The Romans just saw it as just physical pain and torture as punishment. But did you know that the Jewish person that knew his scriptures, that they knew it well, saw the cross as completely different? Let's open up our Bibles to the book of John chapter 19, and we'll begin with verse 5. The scripture will also be on the screen, but we could, we could also open our Bibles. John chapter 19, and we'll start in verse 5. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to him, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him. For I find no fault in him. Now, according to Roman law, Pilate could see no reason for Jesus to be crucified. He could not see any reason that Jesus deserved death. But the next verse is very interesting in verse 7. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Interesting, isn't it? According to Roman law, there was no reason for Jesus' death. But the Jewish law had a reason, a purpose in his death. The Jews, the chief priests and scribes, these scholarly men, were standing before Pilate saying, Our law condemns him to death. And they said, The reason why they want him dead was because he claimed to be the Son of God. There is a very interesting concept here. 
which law did Jesus break then? And this is important. If I were to claim to be God, and let me just say that I'm not, but if I were to say I am God, what law or what concept would I be breaking? That would be blasphemy. I would be blaspheming God. Blaspheming, blasphemy is when a human being claims to take on the prerogatives of God, to be God. So if I look up in the Old Testament, the uh, law on blasphemy, we should be able to see what the Bible says. And we should be able to see if you commit blasphemy, you should be crucified. Does it say that? Well, let's see what Leviticus chapter 24, verse 16 says. Leviticus chapter 24, verse 16. And whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death, and all the congregation shall certainly stone him. The stranger as well as him who is born in the land, when he blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. Now, what does the Bible say? Shall certainly stone him, not crucify him. You know what we all, you know, we, we all make mistakes. No big deal. Churches fall into apostasy. They forget their Bible. Uh, these verses, they just totally forgot. They just didn't know the penalty for blasphemy and stoning. It must have just been a whole big mix-up, you know, 2,000 years ago. Whoops, you know, they, they just totally forgot about it. They didn't understand the word. So it was just a big mistake, was it? No. You think that they... Um, uh, uh, you think that that might have happened? And the answer is, of course not. Let's see what happened when they were accusing Jesus of blasphemy. In John chapter 10, verse 30 and 31. <clears throat> These are Jesus' words. I and my Father are one. So here Jesus is saying that he is like his Father. They are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. So there you go. Did they know the law? They sure did. They knew what the penalty was for blasphemy. Many times they had tried to stone him to death, and he would just slip away or escape. But they had tried again and again whenever he made these kind of statements. We see this in John 8, 58. Like when he said, before Abraham was, I am. So was it a mistake? Did they have a slip of the mind? Did they know this law? Were they mistaking in reading the scriptures? No. So then the question is, why did they want him to be crucified? You see, they knew the Old Testament law much better than we all do. They understood their scriptures much better. For some reason, people don't like to read the Old Testament. But you can't really comprehend the depth of the New Testament unless you understand the Old Testament. Because everything that is in the New Testament is founded and based and grounded in the Old Testament. And there is a perfect example of the ignorance of some Christianities. To be able to understand the Old Testament to under is to understand the New Testament. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 21, and we'll read verses 22 and 23. And we'll see why did they want him to be crucified. Deuteronomy 21, 22, and 23. If a man has committed a sin worthy of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on that tree, but you shall surely bury him that day, so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. 
for he is hang, for he who is hanged is accursed of God. Now let's stop for a moment. So we can so so I could help you see what was what was done in the Old Testament days. When two armies would face off, the victor of the winning army would many times take the king or the son of the king and they would take their bodies and they would just hang them on the wall of the city. They would put them up on the trees and they would hang these dead bodies there to show everyone that their leaders were conquered and, they, and that they were the dominant kingdoms. But the truth is, God said, I don't want you to be like these other kingdoms. Because what they would do is just leave those bodies there for weeks or for months. God says, I don't want you to be like those other kingdoms. I don't want that body to stay on that tree overnight. If you hang up the enemy king on a tree, you need to... Bury him before the sun goes down. Because I don't want dead corpses hanging around my people. But there was a specific person, uh, purpose for hanging them on a tree. The reason you hung them on a tree is because you want to show that they were cursed of God. You want everyone to see that this person is not in God's favor. Remember the story in about David, King David, and his son Absalom. Absalom has challenged his father uh, for the throne. He has split the kingdom and has caused, caused so much problems. But before the kingdoms went out to battle, King David said, Do not kill my son Absalom. I love him. Do not kill him. But as they go out in the, into the field and they are charging and chasing Absalom, Absalom is on his donkey riding and his big, beautiful hair gets caught up in the tree. So when the soldiers come up upon him, they find him hanging in a tree. You may not have understood this at first, <clears throat> but to those soldiers, they knew what this meant. The soldiers went to get their general, Joab, so Joab comes up and kills him. But you say, why? David specifically said, do not kill him. It is because everybody knew what God was saying. God was saying, I curse him. This is, what, this is the way that they would have understood this event. They saw it as a God thing. He is hanging on a tree and they killed him there because they would have seen it, seen it as being cursed of God. But to be cursed from God does, just doesn't mean you die. You know, the, that, the first death, the sleep death. Being cursed of God means you will be outside of the New Jerusalem trying to fight your way in but you will be thrown into the lake of fire as described in Revelation. You will have the second death. And we'll talk a little bit more in a little while about that. <clears throat> so the question is, and I'll ask again, why would the scribes and Pharisees want Jesus to die on the cross? Why would they want him crucified? <clears throat> because they know uh, because they don't want him to just die. They want everybody in Israel to see that he was cursed of God. You, rem you remember what they said when they were walking down below the cross, wagging their finger. If he is the son of God, then come down from there. Because if he stays on the cross, it proves that God has cursed him. Now the prayer makes more sense, doesn't it? Why would Jesus pray on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why would he cry that out in anguish? Because he could not feel his father's presence. As he prayed, 
bearing the sins of the world on himself, as he was offering this prayer, there is no answer of peace. There's no answer of peace in his heart. A black curtain of darkness, gloom, and hopelessness surrounds him as he bears the sins of the world. As he dies, cursed of God. Let's turn our Bibles into the book of Isaiah 53. The famous messianic passage speaking about Jesus and his death on the cross. Isaiah 53, 7 through 9. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before the shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. Verse 9, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich uh, at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Now let's jump to verse 12. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with, a, with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressing, transgressors. This language that is being used about the Messiah is very uh, strange for a Jew to hear. They always saw the Messiah as a conquering king. But here, he is seen as one who is being counted as a transgressor. One whose grave is made with the wicked. His own people came up with a plan to totally disqualify Jesus from being the Messiah. Because if he dies on a tree, if he dies on the cross then it is impossible for a Jew to see him as their king or as their savior. Because how could the Messiah, the Son of God, be cursed of God? It makes no sense to them. It doesn't make a lot of sense to a lot of people, and yet it is true. We have a very simple way of looking at the cross that is very good. And that is when Jesus died on the cross, he died for you and he died for me and he bore our sins on the cross and when we believe in him his life is ours and our old life is his and there is this exchange this substitution that takes place where I receive his righteousness and he he receives my sin it's not fair but it is good and it is beautiful and I am grateful for it God's great love and compassion for us poured out to us in this event. But there is something more to it than we, and that we usually tend to miss. And maybe this is the question that we have to wrestle with. What death did Jesus die? Most other churches, other denominations could not comprehend the depth of this concept because they only understand one type of death. They believe in what is called the first death in the Bible. When we die, we immediately go to heaven. But the Bible teaches that there are two deaths. Let's turn our Bibles into Revelation chapter 20, verses 14 and 15. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into that lake of fire. The second death. At the end of time, there will be a white throne judgment. God is going to pour out fire out of heaven, and he will destroy the devil and his angels and all those who have done wickedly and rejected him. 
And that is called the second death. And we understand that, that this concept is from the Bible. Uh, and from this concept, we understand that this is goodbye forever. Goodbye to life forever. To believe in this concept, you have to believe in the resurrection. And as Seventh-day Adventists and Bible-believing Christians, we don't believe that we go immediately to heaven when we die or immediately go to hell when we die. We believe that there is a sleep, just as Jesus described in the book of John chapter 11, where there is a first resurrection where the righteous are raised to life and those who are living righteous go to heaven and meet with Jesus up in the air and he brings us to heaven. And we're there for a thousand years. We will reign with him uh, as Revelation chapter 20 says. The rest of the dead, though uh, they do not live during this thousand years. Then... With Jesus at the end of the thousand years, Jesus raises all the wicked to life, and they surround the camp of God. And there is a destruction. Now, why does all this matter? Because when we say that Jesus died on the cross, what do we actually mean? Because when there are two different kinds of death, we need to comprehend what type of death was it that he died. The first death, which is asleep, a state of unconsciousness. But at the end, there is a resurrection to life for all. Is that the kind of death that Jesus died? Where he just fell asleep for a few days and he woke up and everything was fine? Was that how he died? Or did he die what the Bible calls the second death? Which is the death of the wicked which is the penalty of sin. Do you, do you remember what God said in the Garden of Eden? He told them not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for that day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then Lucifer comes in uh, disguised as a serpent and tells the woman, you shall not surely die. And people still believe that lie today. They still believe the serpent today. The wages of sin, according to the Bible, is death. Which death? The first death or the second? Uh, technically, it's both deaths, but what is the wages? I mean, we die the, the death of sleep because of sin, but the consequence is the goodbye forever death, the second death. It is goodbye to life forever. We don't deserve to live. But the only reason that any of us is alive today is because of the, the grace of Jesus Christ. The grace of God in giving Jesus Christ. So which death did Jesus die on the cross? Did he die the death of sleep? Or did he die the death of the wicked? He died the wages of sin. He died the death of the wicked, what the death of the wicked deserve. He died the, the death that we understood as, uh, understand as the second death, which means goodbye forever. I want to read something from the Desire of Ages. It is so powerful. These, these are my two favorite uh, paragraphs. It is found in page 753. Um, the first and second paragraph. Upon Christ as our substitute, our surety was laid in uh, the iniquity of, of us all. He was counted a transgressor that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. The guilt of every des descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. The wrath of God against sin the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity filled the soul of his son with consternation. All his life, Christ has been publishing to the 
uh, publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now, with the horrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. The withdrawal of the divine countenance for, from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with, with a sorrow that he can never, that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. Now what's interesting here, why do we emphasize the physical pain so much if he hardly ever even felt it? There was something so much more to the cross than that. Read the second paragraph. Satan, with his fierce temptations, wronged the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. So it was not the physical pain that he experienced on the cross that killed him. It was the anguish of the separation of his father and the weight of sin upon his life that broke his heart. Now there are two things I need to talk about. And please catch this concept. If it means that what Jesus died on the cross was the second death, and the second death means goodbye to life forever. And the book uh, Desire of Ages, written by Ellen White, points out very clearly, very theologically, that Jesus would not have seen himself coming from the grave a conqueror. He would not have seen himself at that moment coming forth out of the grave. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, he knew that the wages of sin is eternal. What does that mean? And I hope you can catch this. This is something that transformed the way I see my God. When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't think that he was dying for just three days. He was, when he was hanging on that cross, he thought that he was dying forever. You might say, but wait a minute. We can quote verses in the Bible that says that, you know, he says, in three days I will be raised up. Yes, he did say that. There are verses in the Bible that say that. And that was the plan of salvation from, the, from before the foundations of the world. But when he was in that moment, when the weight of sin of the world was upon him, when the guilt and condemnation he was experiencing was crushing his life, when the devil was wringing his heart, and when he could not see God's face, it was so awful that at that moment he thought he was dying forever. Intellectually, I know that Jesus survived the cross by believing, by faith, that it was going to happen. But in his, in his experience, and what he was feeling on the cross, that it was um, all, all, you know, that that, that, was, that was the feeling he was getting. He wasn't going to come back a victor. He thought that he was going to die forever. Now, what does that mean? It means that the love of God is so huge. And I mean, if I was Jesus, I, I would have said no. 
to die forever, to never live again, to never be by the side of my father again, to lay down my life, that is too much for me. Who would do that? Well, the Almighty God did it. The Eternal One, the Everlasting, the Creator of the universe would die forever just so His creation could live. That is love, brothers and sisters. He loves us more than He loved Himself. That He wanted us to be there so bad that He was willing not to be there so that we can be there instead. Because when he was hanging on the cross, he was cursed of God. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Galatians, chapter 3. And did the New Testament writers understand this concept of Jesus becoming a curse for us? Paul will make this point way better than I can. Galatians, chapter 3, verse 10. And we read, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is, it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. <clears throat> now let me paraphrase this a little bit. If you do not do everything right <clears throat> your entire life, if you don't keep everything that is in the book of the law, everything that God has told you to do, then you are under a curse. If you have not been perfect in every moment of your entire life, from the beginning to the end, the Bible is saying you are under a curse. How many of us are under a curse today? Now, the rest of you who didn't raise your hands, I don't know. But the Bible says... All have sinned and fallen short from the glory of God. So therefore, we are all cursed. What is God going to do? How will he save us? Verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And there it is. Deuteronomy 21 Chapter 21, verse 22. Paul was a Pharisee. He understood the concept. He knew that those religious leaders, uh, what those religious leaders were doing when they crucified Jesus. Did they know or comprehend that uh, what they were doing uh, while they were putting uh, Jesus on, on that tree? That by making him a curse on a tree, that they were actually saving themselves. Did they have any idea that God would turn uh, their evil deeds into something good? You know, the Bible says in Romans 8.28, uh, I'm sorry, in Romans 8.28, all things work together for good for those who love God are called according to his purpose. Even in the life of Jesus, the cross event, which those men meant for evil, God turned it around into a lot of good. I think of, his, of this experience, understanding this experience, compared to a bride and a flower girl at a wedding. At a wedding, you have this little flower girl, and they go down the aisle, and they have these little flowers, and they are throwing them out as they go down the aisle, and they stand up there. And then they go to the reception, and they have cake, and everything is perfect for that little flower girl. You see, for the flower girl, a wedding is about the cake. It's about the flowers. It's about the experience. But as for the bride, what the bride goes through uh, at the wedding, is an, is, she's there for an entirely different reason. The bride doesn't go to the wedding for the cake. As a, matter, as a matter of fact, most of us who are married realize that the cake 
is probably the, probably the last thing on our minds when you are getting married. It is more a formality than anything else. Or the bride doesn't go <clears throat> to the wedding for the pretty flowers so she can walk down the aisle with her, bou her bouquet. No, that is not why she goes to the wedding. The bride goes to the wedding for the groom. She is there for one reason, because of him. The deeper that we can understand God's love for us, the deeper we can experience God lo God's love with him. The reason I am a Christian today is not that I am going to heaven, although that is pretty nice. The reason I am a Christian today is not because I am afraid I will be burned up in hell. The reason I am a Christian today is not because I need a lot I need a lot of uh, great friends. The reason why I am a Christian is because of the groom, because I have the experience of the bride, and that is I am in love with God. That is why we need to understand it deeper. That is why we need to enter into a love experience with Jesus. That is why we need to connect with him. Because we need the experience of the bride, not the flower girl. We have a lot of flower girls in church. People coming for the wrong reason. There is one reason to be a Christian. There is one reason to be a Seventh-day Adventist today. It is because of Jesus. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, for the love of Christ constrains us, compels us, motivates us, drives us, because we judge thus. And if one died for all, then all died. Verse 15, and he died for all. For those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. You see, the death of Christ is meant to motivate us. His love is meant to charge us and to empower us so that we will no longer live a self-centered life. I just want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. I need more friends. Whatever it is, all of those things fall short of the, of the one great motivation, and that is the connection with the living and mighty God who loved us so much that he was willing to miss out of eternity so that we can experience it. I don't know what else could motivate us. If that doesn't, <clears throat> it's wonderful good news. A God who loves me like that, above and beyond, than what I could think or imagine. We need today, as a Christian church, the experience of the bride. We need to see more and more of the love relationship with Jesus. The world needs to see that because you know what I'm realizing? The world isn't really interested in going to heaven anymore and just going to heaven anymore. Have you ever tried to tell someone, don't you want to go to heaven and live forever? They might be going, eh. Aren't you too afraid of going to hell? No, not really. People don't care about these things as much anymore. Would you like peace? Would you like to experience love like never before? Would you like to find a place within your soul that real goodness comes and lives in your heart and life and turns into a life-changing influence in the lives of others. Wouldn't you like to find real leadership, real power, real life? Would you like to go beyond the mediocre, just going through the motions every day? Would you like to experience the fullness of what it means to be alive, to breathe, and to live? That is Jesus. Amen. Please uh, 
stand and sing our closing hymn, number 626. It is in a little while we're going home. in a little while we're going home. Amen. Amen. That's what it's all about. <clears throat> Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this plan of salvation that was made even before the foundations of the world. The plan for your son to come and die and bear our sins. And even in, in his deepest despair, and not seeing your face, Lord, for the first time in eternity's past, um, going through with this sin when he didn't with with the with dying on the cross when he didn't have to for us, but he loves us so much, and you love us so much, <clears throat> Lord. Thank you for that. We want to thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day. Uh, we ask now, as we're ready to leave, uh, to keep us safe as we go our separate ways to keep us blessed, Lord, and also to bring this message of hope, uh, of the gospel, the good news to those who need it. And those who need it is the world. So, Lord, give us that courage to bring this to the world. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.